Hello, everyone, and welcome to this first webinar that we have on good dissemination practices. My name is Sean Lacey. I'm the university's research integrity and compliance officer. In this first webinar, we're looking at identifying predatory journals. I'm delighted to have Sinead Hanrin in here, our digital scholarship librarian, who will lead us on, on this topic. Before just handing over to Sinead, it's just, I'm going to just, I have three slides basically just to touch on, which is basically to mention, look, what are predatory journals? Why do we see them as being bad? And ultimately, how 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 is this linked with research integrity? And I suppose, and which would then feed into like, why are we actually even doing this kind of, this type of webinar? But essentially, <clears throat> excuse me, predatory journals are basically publications that exploit the publishing model for profit. How they do this, is they charge very high fees to authors without the appropriate oversight then to the uh, research or to the publication that has been submitted. Oversight in terms of editorial services, critiquing, and overall maintaining the rigorous research standards that we actually ha have here. They appear legitimate, so their optics, you know, their web page looks very good, their, um, their email correspondence, all oh, seems very good, but essentially they lack credibility. They lack the quality control that we would expect from reputable scholarly publications. Why do, why do we see them as being bad? And this is not an exhaustive list. This, this is just maybe, just this is essentially to set the scene for, for Sinead to be coming in to show us how do we identify them. But reasons that predatory journals will be seen as bad is essentially they they, there is the risk that they inundate web pages, websites with unedited, unchecked research outputs, research data, whereby a future researcher may look at this and see that, oh, may not may assume that they're being properly cited, may assume that the research that has been published has been proofread, has been critiqued, and they will build their own research upon this. But they're building their own research upon misguided analysis, misguided research outputs in itself. And that has a real knock-on effect to the research record. It also damages a research reputation because when we, if we publish in predatory journals, there is a lack of credibility and a lack of, uh, within the research community with regard to that. And also, and again, th this is not exhaustive, definitely not exhaustive, but why another reason why predatory journals are bad is they are essentially a breach of the integrity and reliability of research. And what that would just bring us into, uh, bring us into is kind of the research integrity. And so what we have here in the university is we have a research integrity policy that was approved by the Research Council and the Academic Council back in May earlier this year. And in that research integrity uh, policy, it calls out four principles around research integrity. And our research integrity policy is aligned with national and international good practice in this area as well. And the four principles of research integrity that we look at, but again, it's not uh, integrity is not restricted to these, is around accountability, honesty, reliability, and respect. Now we could speak about these four principles and how predatory journals are not in compliance with these, but if you just look at one, reliability. Straight away, predatory journals, they are in conflict, they're not in compliance with reliability of our research outputs, which is not in compliance with our research integrity policy. Over the summer, there was a European Code of Conduct for Research Integrity published. The, uh, this is the summer being June 23. There was a previous version, which was in 2017, so there's an updated version now, and what's quite nice and very much welcome in the updated version is the call out in the uh, in the new code how engaging with predatory journals is actually seen as an unacceptable research practice. You can see a bit of a definition here that is taken from um, from the European Code of Conduct, but it just calls out that uh, how it is a breach of research integrity. So for us, then it's a case of if we know that predatory journals are bad and we potentially know why they're bad. And how why we should be avoiding them, it's a case of then, well, how do we identify them? How do we, if we are approached by a predatory a, a journal, how do we know that they're predatory as opposed to being something that is reputable? And so for this, I'm delighted to have Sinead Hanran, our digital scholarship librarian, who will actually sh show us the flags to identifying predatory journals. Over to you, Sinead. Thanks very much, Sean. Uh, just give me one second now, folks, and I'll share my screen. Okay, can we see that? Yep, that's all fine. Perfect. So uh, we're going to, this is kind of going to be a whistle stop, a whistle stop uh, tour of what predatory journals are, what they're not, the context they exist in and the characteristics that they have so we can begin to um, be more cognizant um, uh, of the journals we engage with. 
and maybe start looking for these in all the journals we engage with, because quite frankly, there is increasingly a blur. The line is becoming blurry between what is predatory and what is legitimate. Um, so oh, there we go. So we'll just look at uh, the, uh, at the defin. I suppose a definition. Um, it was it was relatively recently when this was when this definition was proposed. Um, a a team of twelve leaders in the areas of research, publishing, libraries came together in Canada in April twenty nineteen to put this together. And what they came up with in terms of a definition for predatory journals was that they are journals and publishers that are entities that prioritize self-interest at the expense of scholarship and are characterized by false or misleading information. They deviate from best practice editorial and publication practices. They lack transparency in their operations and or use aggressive and indiscriminate solicitation practice. Now, that's quite a broad definition um, of a uh, what a predatory journal is. So what they've included, essentially, the points are motivated by self-interest. That is, the journal is motivated by self-interest, either to gain uh, money or status through the journal, uh, false or misleading information, very substandard peer review and editorial processes, um, solicitates uh, submissions, so they're contacting you, telling you they need, they, they need submissions, and there's a huge lack of transparency in terms of how they operate. What they haven't included, and what is maybe the things that people would most associate with a predatory journal are the intention to, to, to deceive the researcher into, um, into publishing with them, into letting them think it's a legitimate journal. The reason they took that out is because they felt that it didn't account for the people that, that actually seek out these journals, knowing they're predatory, but also knowing that they can get a publication out of it and are happy to engage, or basically are, are, want to engage with it. Um, they don't bring up things like uh, that it's often designed specifically to look like a legitimate journal, often a copy of a legitimate journal. Um, and it didn't say anything about things like fake or stolen imagery. Um, and the, really the reason I think anyway that they went with this approach is that they only looked at it from the point of view of the researcher. And I think that's a kind of a misstep. I think we need to be engaging in all three perspectives when we're talking about research um, or predatory publishing. So you, the perspectives are the, the journal itself, the researcher that is a good actor that intent that is seeking out to, 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 to publish in a legitimate journal and the, uh, the bad actor, the researcher that knows they're engaging with a predatory journal but continues to do it anyway. That's, that's the entire point for them. Um, the reason I feel that it's, it's important for us to engage with predatory publishing via these three public these three um perspectives is for the journal they want to catch both types of researcher they're not just in the business of one or the other they want to make as much money as they can so they want to engage with as many researchers of of whatever motivation as they can so that broadens for me what a um predatory journal or predatory publishing looks like so if we were now this is in no way an exhaustive list. This is basically what I could comfortably fit on the slide and thought that would be of use. It, this, this list changes uh, as publishing changes, as the technology that we use to publish changes. Um, it's why I would encourage a kind of people take a, criti a critical analysis approach to predatory journals rather than sort of um, just give me a list and I won't use that list kind of thing. It's changing too much and we have to keep pace with that. But the things that uh, to really that really probably don't change are the kind of operational or uh, policy type elements of it. So the prioritized self-interest, that basically means they are only doing it to make money for it to be a business or to increase their status. So to have the citations and have the impact of those citations on their career. They generally, the idea with academic publishing is to share knowledge. That is the motivation for it. That is absolutely not the motivation for a predatory journal. So first of all, that that's the linchpin of it. 
the other ones to keep it is like is the intention to deceive the researcher or the reader i think all predatory journals do that they are definitely trying to deceive someone it doesn't matter what who else they're catching in the process they are looking to deceive the information they have is false or misleading very substandard peer review and they solicit the the things but the things i'd like to kind of look at are things that you might you mightn't notice so like the name or acronym is similar to the same um is are the same to an established journal and i'll talk a little bit about that about how we we are seeing that happen already and they both look like legitimate journals uh, a very low quality website fake or stolen imagery um i've seen pe- our researchers that have no engagement whatsoever with a journal have their name been taken and put on as editors without their knowledge or, or their um their consent uh, um known bad actors in the area being added to the editorial board and then little things that maybe you wouldn't catch but to somebody who knows what they're looking for they're kind of glaring so no doi it is very irregular in this day and age for a journal to be publishing without offering um a, 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 a digital um, object identifier they're a core part of the infrastructure of research now it's odd to not see them even more odd particularly if a journal is claiming to be open access is to not provide creative commons licenses on the articles um that's that that's that's strange uh one of the the low apc that was definitely more common earlier on i think because Gold open access and APCs in general have become more common in the infrastructure. They've actually they're starting to put up those prices, but you'll still see a fairly low APC. You're talking anything between twenty to a hundred dollars would be considered, um, or even up to, to be honest, even up to five hundred dollars would be considered fairly low for an APC. Um, it's not listed in any discovery platforms. Um, this can be hit or miss. Sometimes you have a well-intentioned journal that is maybe poorly resourced or it's it's new it hasn't gotten to that point yet um but it, it it's definitely a, a a flag to 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 take notice of it claims indexing in, in um things like google scholar or scopus or doaj and they absolutely are not uh, indexed there the big one extremely quick peer review we are in the middle of a peer review, peer review crisis if a journal is claiming to have a quick peer review turnaround time that is a massive red flag because quite frankly, anyone who's legitimate will will not understand how they're achieving that. So that begs the question, are they doing actual peer review or is it just, again, they're just throwing it up there for the citations, for the clicks, for the money. And then the lack of transparency. The lack of transparency is something that actually colours or doesn't colour um, the, the field of academic publishing. Some, some uh, journals are better than others. So that isn't something that just influences predatory publishing but it is something that um is also a, a cause of concern what i want to point out here is that i find that predatory publishing is talked about in a vacuum and not spoken about in terms of the context it exists in and when we're talking about predatory journals what we're actually talking about is research misconduct a predatory journal is probably one of the most one of the most outrageous acts of research misconduct you can uh, engage in because it's so loud. Normally, people are trying to ha- hide their misconduct, but they want to engage with you. They want to make money from you. So it's 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 a really outrageous act in its in itself. It's almost daring you to 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 report it or whatever you whatever you have. But it also has its tentacles in different aspects of the academic publishing cycle. So it's in academic publishing, legitimate and ones that have questions over it. It it's in open research because these are all digital uh, platforms that they're making, which is what open um is built on. It's full of questionable research practices from the journal and from, and sometimes, not always, from uh, the researchers who are submitting to it. And it reflects uh, the situation we're in, in terms of research culture. But this whole, that whole, those four points, they're all existing within the, the discussion we are having around research integrity in general. They're not separate from it, they're part of a continuum. And 
you will have, and if you think of it as a continuum or a spectrum, you will have journals that are on one end um, that are absolutely predatory journals. And on the other, they're the most uh, reputable, legitimate journals ever happen. But you'll have stuff in the middle as well that are doing some things that cause concern, but then doing others that don't. And we have to be, we have to start thinking about publishing in that in that lane. These aren't outliers, they're part of the system itself and it's all connected. So why do they exist? Well, it's the digital age, the infrastructure and technology is there to make to allow them to exist. That's the first point. Opportunity. There has never been a industry that hasn't found um people to kind of be be grifters who will see see an opportunity and try and create for lack of a better word a black market for it this is the same thing we we see it in everything um what, something that i think may, people may not be fully aware of is academic publishing is probably one of the most lucrative businesses you can be in it year on year will often make as much as 40 percent in terms of profit margin compare that to apple google that they're often only making five or ten percent profit margin. This is forty percent, and this is forty percent of a multi-billion-dollar industry, and it's held by five by the five big publishers. So they're making anywhere between one and three billion a year in profit alone. Like cost is covered just in profit is billions. So it's if you're if you're if that's your thing, it's a great business to be in. It will make you very rich. Um, research culture, the, the publisher parish culture, that research prestige and progression is tied to a number of what number of publications you have rather than the quality of research you have done is a massive, massive problem and incentivize this type of behavior. If the number of publications you have is the key to you either securing a grant or a, a permanent position or something like that, it doesn't take a genius to figure out there are quicker ways to get your numbers up without having to engage in the arduous work of actually doing the research. And this is the space that these predatory publishers are moving into. And then we live in a time of speed. Speed is currency now. The quicker you can get something, the better. And people will pay for speed. And that's what predatory journals um, are offering because they're not doing the peer review. They can say, yeah, no problem. Here you go. That'll be up tomorrow for you. Um, what risk do they pose to research? So Sean touched on this a little bit already, but the spread of misinformation, and I know people are kind of sick to death of hearing about this, but the re it's kind of the one of the main problems of our age. So when I was doing up these slides, I read a story of a woman who, um, she was diagnosed with stage four cancer and traditional medicine could, did, didn't have anything else to offer her. So she went to alternative med medicine and she found an article that spoke about um, vitamin infusions that had you know, great results had been found from it. And she kind of felt like I have a chance. She felt like she'd found something that might save her life. And she brought she brought it to her son in law, who happens to be a researcher and who was happened to be one of the people that was part of that group that 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 created that definition in Canada. And he saw the paper and he said, this is this is fake. This is a made up thing. And that was just pure happenstance. What are the chances of someone having someone like that in their life who could actually make that call? It's I, Sean is the stats man, so he might be able to come up with something uh, for us on that. But it is not a reasonable thing for people to be able to do. It causes real danger. And as Sean says, if you are a researcher and you think this is a legitimate paper and you start building more research on that, you're building on a house of sand. It is dangerous and it can cost lives. It's a waste of funding. The funding that is done in most countries is primarily funded by the state. Everything that is, and that's either by direct funding, say through SFI or the IRC or you know, through Horizon or anything like that, but also, even if you're doing research off your own back and you are an employee of a university in this country, you are employed by state funds. So that re the research you're doing is being paid for by state funds. So 
it's a huge waste of 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 money uh state money that could be you put to better health it harms the discipline you work in because things get found out that's the one thing i will say is that this always gets detected because that's the other side of it being a digital um a, 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 of us being in a digital world these things are much easier for us to find out now it's a waste of your time as a researcher if you engaged in a project for two years and you published it in a journal that you thought was legitimate that and that and and it coming out that oh actually that's a fake journal or it's a predatory journal that 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 research you've done is suddenly is going to be dis discounted you have to start again i mean that's crushing for a researcher it could have huge uh, a huge a hugely detrimental effect on your future career prospects and it's just again a massive waste sean mentioned the research record if we cannot trust the record of research, we can't build on it. If we can't build on it, we're nowhere. Um, the the other side of that as well is that the re is that the record can be lost. So the vast majority of legitimate journals will um have archiving procedures and standards that they have to adhere to, so that your outputs are ne are you can are not lost completely to the wind. So you know, to, to avoid duplication and stuff like that. These sites have no such qualms. They are going to do whatever they want to do. And if they want to just turn off that website one day, they will. And that's your work gone as well. Um, and then finally, as, as Sean outlined, it's a total disruption of research integrity. It flies in the face of it. There's no accountability. There's no reliability, no honesty and no respect. Those four principles are everything that we build research on. And not one of them can be upheld by the act of predatory journals. So what should you look for when you're looking out for a journal? So we'll just have a quick video here. You've done your research and now you are ready to publish. But untrustworthy publishers can harm your reputation and obscure your work. With so many journals and books being published every year, choosing a trusted publisher can be daunting and time-consuming. Think Check Submit helps guide researchers and librarians when making publishing decisions. Before deciding, step one, think, can I trust this journal or publisher with my research? Step two, check, do I need more information? Does the publisher journal publish research that you would read? Do the academic editors have a proven record in your field? Can you tell which organization publishes the journal or book? Can you contact them easily? Does the journal or book publisher have editorial policies in place and conduct appropriate peer review? Are there fees to publish? If so, are they clear? Do you recognize the names of any editorial board members? Are the journals or books indexed in any discovery services? Step three, if you can answer yes to most of these questions, then submit. For your next article, book, or book chapter, remember, think, check, submit. Find more tips on our website. Checklists for journals, books, and chapters are available in multiple languages. So that's Think, Check, Submit. That is a, an incredibly useful resource for you. I've provided a link for it um, and you'll be able to use that in the slides. And you'll see here I have a hyperlinking for journal checklist. We're going to look at that in a few minutes. But that is a checklist that Think, uh, or that think Check, Submit provide. That is very, very useful for you to do your own checks when you engage with a journal. Um, so at this point now, I actually want us to look at an example of both. A, it, this journal is somehow an excellent and terrible example of a predatory journal. And that's why I want to spend let, have us spend a little time on it. So just give me two seconds now um, and I will move. Uh, I'm just going to bring this over here, I hope. Sorry, let's uh, double screen now isn't being very kind to me. 
I'll just stop sharing for one second while I get this properly done. Okay. So this is the Think Check Submit site. Great resource to use. I would use it. I use it all the time when I'm doing checks for people. Um, and I would strongly encourage everyone else to engage with it. They have a checklist here for you. For They have one for books and they have one for journals. Uh, they have it here live on the thing, but they also have a download available. So what I, this is here, what I would do personally is that when I would be doing a publishing plan, I would go through Think, Check, Submit for the journals I'm considering and actually keep a record of the results I got for that as a as proof that you have do, done your due diligence as a researcher um, and that you have made reasonable efforts to not engage with predatory publishing. Um, and as a record yourself for publishers that you feel you can you can trust and thing and things like that. So that's Think Check Submit. So no, I just need to move this guy out of the way for me. Um, but what we're going to look now at uh, this journal, the American Journal of Engineering Research. Um, it, this looks like some sort of army uh, logo straight off. So like straight away, the aesthetics of this are jarring. Um, but they have done a lot to kind of make you question whether you're being too judgmental or not. So first off, right, the ISSN. So an ISSN is basically like a PPS number for a journal. It's kind of the first kind of stage of checking legitimacy. So they, they have gotten their ISSN numbers up here. I actually went away and checked on those ISSN numbers. And curiously, the American Journal of Engineering Research is registered in India. Flag number one. Why would it do that? That doesn't make sense. Second of all, okay, the aesthetics we have to, like having this carry on of all these bubbles and stuff like that, that is not something you expect to see in a journal. Um, uh, a sign that was up there celebrating a religious holiday, again, not something you would expect to see on a journal, particularly a journal that is has in no way related to any kind of theology or anything like that. Um, you might have seen there on the screen, they said to email the editor, to um, email a, a, a mail.com or something like that. It isn't on the server, basically. So that would suggest to me that it's not a legitimate email source or that um, it goes nowhere here. Editormails.com, very dodgy, straight away. That should say, if, if it was a legitimate um, publication, it should either say at whatever their donate domain is or whatever their publisher is. So let's say if it was published by Taylor and Francis, it should be a Taylor and Francis email, um, which it clearly isn't. Then we come down here, right? And it starts giving you all this information. And if you read this, it's, you can see that it's very repetitive. So straight away, you're like, this is a bit odd. Um, it gives facts that in no way can be substantiated. Impact factor. It does not have an impact factor. I, I I can tell you that straight away. And even just the way it's done it, I don't know if you can see, but they have added an image over the, the larger impact factor image to basically put an impact factor in there. It's not legitimate. Um, these things I found really, like offering up a model paper, not something you would see. A, a download certificate, again, not something that you would regularly see um, on it at all. It, but then it does things that would make people question it. So it has a copyright infringement claim it is, uh, and it has journal ethics, right? And it's giving statements on all the things you would expect it to give a statement on. But the curious thing is, well, first of all, there's typos. Again, you wouldn't expect to see that on a legitimate journal. But look, things happen, you know, but it it's making statements on things like article sharing, which would be archiving, copyright, uh, open access, but it's not um, naming any of the best, practi best practices or organizations involved in that. Article sharing, I would be expecting something 
on in terms of an open access definition there i would be expecting something that maybe references sharper romeo that helps you identify um appropriate uh archiving policies open access licenses there's no mention of uh creative commons which is the standard in open access licensing text mine things like that it again very weird and no mention of cope or any other um leading uh, ethics um organization in terms of publishing ethics but they have but they do have statements and they would and if you're not someone who's very familiar with academic publishing that that might be, be enough to convince you that this is a legitimate organization so i then went and started looking at their their archive Again, this is another thing people say, like if it has an archive, it's more than likely legitimate. Okay, so let's go to the archive. So I actually checked through this. There are, there are papers in all of these. However, I went to the closest one and we'll go in there now again. So this is the most recent uh, issue that they have. And just, for just keep an eye there to see number six there rice transplanter for establishment of rice comparison of its performance with conventional method now look at number 15 rice transplanter for establishment of rice comparison they've put the same article in twice with different page numbers so we look again i'll just let that load there go back up to number six So here we are. So no DOI, definitely a question mark over that. Look how short the peer review uh, is, two weeks. That's shockingly short. And no mention of Creative Commons, even though it's supposed to be an open access publication. So that was the what this, so that, this has been added as Seven pages between 31 and 38. Grand. Oh, that's the same one again. Let's try this one. Here is the exact same article, but now it's on page 124 to 131. And the submission dates have changed. It was submitted on the 15th and accepted on the 30th. Exact same article. So... There's this, so you can see like there's, they have ways of making themselves look legitimate, but they're hiding in plain sight. There's just one more thing I wanted to show you, which I got, I got a bit of a kick out, kick of, uh, a kick out of. Does this seem familiar to anyone, this, this, uh, this logo? Because it, it, it was familiar to me. It's the FAI logo from a few years back. So this is something else they do. They create they, they steal imagery and logos and things and it was by pure happen happen chance that i went for this journal and then ended up finding uh finding this you know there's a finite there's a finite amount of people who would recognize that logo and so i thought that was that was kind of one of my favorite parts of this journal though i have to say but the other thing that to keep an eye on the logo is advertising a association that apparently legitimizes this journal so the association is the open access journal publishers association it's a phony association it doesn't exist it isn't real but what they are doing is they are basing it on oaspa this is an organization i have worked with for a long time they are a very legitimate organization um they're one of the leaders in open access publishing and that and this this uh these individuals that are running this AJER uh uh journal um are trying to to benefit off that. But the 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 other thing they're trying to do is is benefit off similar journals in the area. So this is the Journal of Engineering Research, slightly different name, 
but the acronym is fairly similar, TG instead of AJ. And this journal is based out of University in Oman. It's a legitimate journal. It's, it's under-sourced. So there are things about it that would maybe flag, mostly aesthetic things that would be flags for people. But I've done the checks on it. They are legitimate. They're using COPE standards. They are... Um, they are uh, indexed in the places they say they're indexed in. They are trying to be a legitimate journal. But this one is trying to kind of maybe uh, base themselves on it. So these are the type of things that they will do. So like they'll have like your review process, again, making people feel comfortable that things are being done right. But there's no, how do you know any of this is being done right? Absolutely no way whatsoever. I went into a few of the articles. Some of them are just headings and with bullet points, really hit and miss stuff. Um, a definite uh, one to be um, uh, careful with. So that's that chart. So that's the kind of thing you're dealing with when it comes to deciding whether a journal is legit or not. So I'm just going to, I'll stop the share again and share uh, my other screen again. And we'll go back to the slides. So, oh, this is my way now. Yeah. So, what the question I get all the time is Is there a list I can check? And the answer is no. There's no comprehensive list. Uh, Beale used to have a list that does that was retired in 2017. Um, dummy lists have jumped up, but quite frankly, there is no. It's too complex. You have to assess every journal yourself, um, to be sure, to be comfortable. Um, I I wouldn't be kind of handing out my critical analysis processes to a list. I would want to engage. Um, with the actual journal itself and make that decision based on uh, legitimate criteria. There's The other point is there's too much unknown about scholarly publishing itself. Journals, even good journals, are resistant to transparency. So there's a lot we don't know. So I couldn't make a, I couldn't make a call. And we'll, we'll spend a little time now on a, on a publisher that is a reason why you couldn't just make a call based on a list. The quality of journals fluctuate. You might have uh, editorial teams leave and then the journal goes down, all those type of things. Publishing standards are changing. Some journals don't keep up as quick as the others. And the other reason is creators of lists are targeted. Beale was massively targeted and other people who have spoken out against journals have had uh, smear campaigns um, raised against them and all these other things to basically um, bully them into changing what they said. The other question I get is this open access is fault. Um, you often hear the line open access predatory journals. This kind of gets my goat a bit because there's a couple of reasons. First of all, it's a research integrity issue. Any kind of bad act, knowing bad acting like this in research is a research integrity issue. It is somebody looking at the state of play in research, making a decision and acting on it. You cannot blame the infrastructure that is around, the technology is around for that. And the reason in particular that I um, get quite annoyed about it is because open access isn't just the access, isn't just something being freely available to read online. There are criteria that are involved that actually denote open access. So when we talk about open access, we're talking about an online on paywalled access to peer reviewed research outputs with limited copyright and licensing restrictions. So what the journal we just looked at we, I can be fairly confident in saying the work is not being peer reviewed. There is no licensing being applied to it. So nobody knows what, they are, what they're legally allowed to do with those papers if they did decide to use them. And there's um, no clear indication of the copyright either. That isn't that to me, that is not an open access um, journal at all. Without, without that licensing and um, copyright criteria, it isn't open access. It's just something put on a website. That's all. And that could change at any point. But if it's open access, there are rules, there are terms, there are standards. So 
considering everything we've just talked about and what I said about that it's very complex and that we're on a continuum and there are things certain journals do well and things that give call, give pause. I want us to talk just a little bit about MDPI. It's one of the biggest publishers of the last 10, 12 years, but increasingly it is calls have been made to say that it is actually a predatory publisher. So I wanted us to go back to our characteristics that we spoke about and see how many of them would MDPI reach. So I had a quick look over it. Anything in bold, I think is an is fairly indisputable in terms of N um, MDPI at the moment. Anything in italis is up is basically I would like more evidence for. That doesn't mean it's not true or is true, um, but I just wasn't comfortable making a definitive uh, claim either way. So prioritizes self-interest, so prioritizes money. MDPI is 100% a business. It is not interested, or at least it's not its main interest to further the knowledge of research. It's, its interest is in making money. In 2022, no, sorry, 2020, they published 300,000 articles all of which are paid for with a, a, an APC that generally ranges bet between one and four thousand dollars. Three hundred thousand at that cost. That is a business that has found an, an incredible money making uh, uh, model for themselves. Um, and the other issue with that is that the, the massive uh, increase in its acceptance rate last year, its acceptance rate was at 50 percent. That's a huge number of papers to be accepting. And obviously begs the question, is the peer review being done? We don't know, it's peer review. Um, there's increasingly questions about its peer review. It averages at about 17 days, which is obscenely quick for a peer review. Uh, very similar to what we just saw in that journal. Um, and there have been walkouts from editorial boards because of the pressure they felt from MGPI as the publisher to engage in substandard um, uh, research practices, publishing practice. So the, the, the editorial board of Nutrients, the journal Nutrients walked out. And interestingly, a reviewer, Dr. Sergei Gromanov, was a reviewer in the journal Atmosphere. And he reviewed an article that had an awful lot of issues and basically handed it back to the research and said, look, you need to make a lot of changes. It went through two rounds of changes, still wasn't quite up to up to spec. And this uh, this Dr. Gromanov was absolutely stunned to see that Atmosphere published the original submitted version of that article, the one that had no improvements added to it, the original submitted version. They published that. They just they wanted the money. That was it. Um, they definitely solicit submissions. I'd say most people in um, MTU who are um, research active will have received an email at some point from MDPI asking to either edit a um, special issue or peer review a paper. And often you're, at, you're, you're being asked to peer review a paper that isn't in your discipline, that you are not an expert in. Massive, massive red flags. This, the, the special issue thing is something that has been a hallmark of MDPI, the questionability of MDPI. Normally a special issue, you wouldn't have that until uh, maybe you'd do it for a special occasion or to celebrate a special um, researcher. But they actually now are publishing more special is issues than they are publishing regular issues. Huge, huge issue there. Um, they have been removed from discovery services, so from Calivate, one of a couple of their journals have been re removed from there, uh, which is a massive, massive knock and an indictment of where the where they are as a publisher. Um, the National Publication Committee in Norway actually created a new. They, so basically, they normally have two levels to characterize journals: level one and level two. Level one is high quality. Level two is, you know, okay. They created level X, which basically was specifically characterized almost for MDPI. So to say that there are huge concerns about this journal, but they can't quite declare it predatory because there's some things they are doing well. And those things that they do well is that some journals are, are run very well. And then there's the other things like 
the, the, the websites look the spot look the right they are making claims to the right policies like cope um they are using uh, um dois creative commons and they're listed the ones that are listed are listed in, in good in indices so it's it's tough it's tough to make a wholesale decision on it um and i'll just make one thing i wanted to point out uh, with uh, MGPI, which I think is very interesting, is we spoke about them using um about using names that are similar. So MGPI have journals called Cells, Cancers, Polymers, Remote Sensing, Animal and Genes. Right, they're all you know legitimate journals according to MGPI, but their names are taken from these Elsevier, Wiley, and Cambridge journals: Cell, Polymer gene, remote sensing of environment, and then for Wiley, cancer and Cambridge animal. That's highly suspicious, highly underhanded, and is definitely trying to deceive people. So I suppose to wrap up, my, 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 I suppose my sign off would be, be careful with what you're doing. Engage in the checks. Don't just think, oh, this looks grand, so it's fine. It may not be. If you are unsure or you want to hand contact me, I will happily engage with an assessment of a journal um with you um to ensure that you're not uh being uh caught in um a, a, a predatory journal uh trap. So I have a list of uh sort of resources here that I used to prepare this. And if you need anything from me, then you can give me a shout here. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sinead. That was uh, very good, very so informative. So informative. It's, um, I think check submit uh, webpage looks very good, actually. I, I yeah, hadn't seen they've that improved before. it over the last couple of years. It, there's yeah. a lot more there now. Yeah, very good. And just the way you mentioned MDPI, it was just interesting. Uh, so there's a World Conference on Research Integrity. It runs every two years. Uh, yeah. So the next iteration is in Athens in, next year, in 24. But in 22... MDPI were one of the sponsors of the World Conference on Research Integrity, but in 24, so next year's one, the MDPI asked to sponsor a part of it and they were, it was rejected, it was refused. Yeah. So which they, I thought I, was interesting in itself, you know. Yeah, I, I remember that there was quite a lot of uproar um, about mm -hmm. that. And even in my own profession of librarianship, um, there was quite a lot of uproar at the National uh, uh, academic and the N academic library conference this past year when MDPI were there as sponsors as well a lot of librarians felt hugely kind of betrayed by it and I think it's impossible I think it's important as well to keep in mind that so the likes of say DOAJ which are often regarded as like a, a seal of approval for 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 an OA journal and they are to a certain extent but they are being funded by MGPI and other large publishers. So there's obviously a huge, like I have spoken to people who work for the DOAJ who said, we know stuff is wrong, but we are we don't have any control of it because they are funding us, we exist because of them. And like, that's a failure again of the research culture. There was opportunities for institutions to support the DOJ to keep it um, objective, as I suppose and they didn't follow through. And this is what happens, then industry steps in and, and basically you kind of have a compromise situation. So again, another list isn't enough. You need to go in yourself and kind of really dig in and see, is this trustworthy or not? Which, and that last point there does speak to just the question there about, do we have a platform or a list endorsed by M2 like Beale's list? So I think you, you've covered that. And no, I, kind of I, I wouldn't endorse any list to be honest, because it changes yeah. too much. And I think on that, then it's just that the very good of you that to, to give your details to reach out to uh, if, if people have um, any questions, maybe with journals and just maybe to kind of say, look, it's actually a resource that I've used myself where I've been unsure of journals uh, or maybe looking for guidance on some uh, open access journals. And Sinead has been brilliant and so supportive and all of that. So I could definitely um, uh, would advocate for that to reach out to Sinead. Yeah, if that's, any questions. that's what I'm here for. Like, so yeah. don't hesitate. That's part of my job. So I'm. Yeah happy for that okay Conferences, so yeah uh, i i'd give it a go so basically i i can kind of have a look around for you i know i know what to look for i put it to you that way 
Predatory conferences is another one. So that's that yeah. is actually called out in the European Code of Conduct for Research Integrity that was shown up earlier on. And I think the plan will be maybe to do a session on that maybe in the new year because yeah. there is a lot. I mean, I definitely get, I am seem to be getting a, a lot of emails about, from predatory conferences. Yeah. Uh, so we maybe look to do a session on, on that one because I think it would be useful. Uh, yeah, they're, they're sure. increasingly becoming um, more, more frequent and are becoming kind of like the special issue thing now. Yeah, where people and are going to get a quick citation and just pay for it, basically. Yeah, because you can see it's conferences with with that publication uh, opportunity then from it. You yeah. know, so uh, the and I definitely, from my point of view, I think if somebody offers a very tight, a very quick turnaround, that is just mm -hmm. a red flag because we know, like, we're inundated with work. You know, in our in this sector, you know. So I mean, if somebody said they can do something within a week or two weeks, there is a bit of a pause. Let's pause and just double check that. I definitely find that out. Um, look, uh, nice comments coming in there, just praising this presentation. It's, it's so useful. No, there's no doubt about it. It just, it, it was funny. The FAI logo, how <laughs> apt was that that you were doing a presentation here and uh, you know, you came across it, that? It was pure chance. I went yeah. to that journal, uh, because of something else that was flagged in it, and then I just scrolled down. And I goes, That's the FAI logo. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so. So look, there's no other question there, but I, I maybe have one and I'm just going to yeah. kind of play a devil's advocate situation here. So I'm not speaking from um, personal experience or anything like that, but just say uh, somebody is an experienced researcher. They they want to publish. Mm -hmm. They have a very good pedigree themselves. They work in a research team where everyone is actually at a very good standard and they have a, a, their own maybe internal peer review. Mm -hmm. And they'd say, look, we've reviewed it as a team. We've reviewed it. We're happy with the publication. We don't mind pub uh, predatory journals. They'll give us a quick turnaround what are your thoughts on something like that? Uh, I would be question, questioning how they got to that re level of reputation if that is their decision process capabilities. Um, that doesn't that isn't something that somebody just arrives at later in their career. They have obviously, in my mind, been engaging in that type of behavior going on. So to be honest, if I was on a team and someone established flag that, that's a massive red flag to me. Uh, what's the rush publish it in a proper journal get the proper recognition anyone who's a real researcher and but I what I mean by real is somebody who's in who values research that wants research to be right that wants it to be read that wants it to be depended on would in no way shape or form knowingly say let's go to a predatory journal um so if you hear any sniff of that that's a that's a red flag and you want to be thinking about your choices <laughs> to be quite honest with you Thanks very much, Sinead. No, thanks for that. Uh, any other questions maybe in the chat or colleagues can unmute and ask a question if they want. Okay, we're coming up to time there now, Shorty. So this uh, recording will be shared on our YouTube channel afterwards, but just maybe to let you know, so obviously this session here today, this webinar was on identifying predatory uh, journals. Next week, we have our second webinar, which is going to be looking at essentially good authorship practices. And I'll, I'll actually be leading that out in that one as well. Uh, so um, look, maybe until next, we'll see you again next week. And uh, again, thanks very much now for to Sinead uh, for everything for this. All the best, everyone. Bye now. Thanks, Sean. Thanks, everyone.